As we move into the monthly format of Ask EMBN, the big question, the big picture question we've got this week is, does more money give you more speed? Chris, can I dive in here? Because uh, there's many ways of answering this question, but one that trumps it all is rider weight. It doesn't matter if you're on a 2,000 pound bike or a 10,000 pound bike, if you're lighter, you're gonna be able to get up those hills faster. Yeah, I think that's one thing we see a lot of on the channel is light riders smashing us heavier riders uphill. We've seen it on many, many occasions when we learn those verses. Yeah. Lighter riders just fly up the hills yeah. and we're left trundling behind. It's all about the power to weight ratio. Obviously on the downhill sections, it does not matter as much. It doesn't matter if you're heavy or light, you're gonna be able to get down that hill depending on your skill levels. But Chris, what about the, the, the component, the material factors involved in this question? Obviously, in the mountain bike uh, environment, you actually pay for you pay for those grams, you know. Yeah. But uh, materials, I mean, you can't make sweeping statements where one material is superior to the other, right? Kind of like carbon versus aluminium. No, you, your carbon versus aluminium versus steel. It all comes down mm -hmm. to the manufacturing integrity uh, of that material, not just the material. What about motors? Is one motor faster up and down? Well, I think we see obviously different torque figures um, on all motors, you know, like mm. a, some of the bigger motors, 120 newton meters, yeah. and you've got the weaker ones so around 60, yeah. but is it going to be faster? Is it going to be slower? They all get to the top of the hill, and I suppose it depends how much you're going to put into it as I, well. I think there are marginal differences mm. between a 60 newton meter motor and a 120 newton meter motor. Yeah. I think the, the, the the strong, you know, the, the stronger torque does actually get you up there quicker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it always comes down to rider skill. Rider skill. Because some the there's some climbs where a great rider will be able to get up on a 60 newton meter mm -hmm. bike, whereas a less skilled rider might still struggle on 120 newton meter. Yeah. Bike. And I think one of those big differences in those difference in motors is the 25 kilometer hour restriction. Mm -hmm. I think some of those motors, are, you know, perform differently above that restriction mm -hmm. as well. So. And what about to consider. what about this one then? Right. How about you've got a a higher torque motor mm -hmm. which is heavier, and you've got a lower torque motor which is lighter. Yeah. Maybe the lighter motor is going to make it more nimble going downhill. So yeah. maybe the more the higher the torque is going to be faster uphill, but because the lighter motor is going to be faster down, all right? Yeah, it's all round, you know, swings and roundabouts on the motors, I suppose, when it comes down to it. Uh, suspension, yeah. I think 100%. If you've mm -hmm. got good suspension, which you've paid a lot more money for, yeah. that's going to give you more contact with the ground. It's going to keep the tyre on the ground, gripping. Yeah. I, I think you, you pay your money, you get Definitely. your performance. I right? think it makes a massive difference as well, you know, strength, the, the components as well. As you mentioned, grip, the way the bike handles, mm -hmm. if the bike's sticking to the ground and you've got grip, you're going to be faster. Yeah. Wheels? Wheels, yeah, I think you do get a performance advantage in wheels as yeah. well. The lighter yeah. wheels are, are going to be faster than a heavy set. Of well, wheels. lighter, or maybe maybe they've got good mm. compliance to them. That's yeah. that's where that's where the money is, right? Yeah. What about batteries? Batteries. Now, obviously, the more expensive batteries, you're going to get bigger range. So, in mm. effect, you're going to be able to ride in those higher power modes exactly. for longer. So exactly. that's a big difference in batteries. So, really, you are, if you, the more you pay for, you are actually going to get more. You are going to be faster because, like you say, you're going to be riding those higher power modes. Yeah. So, mm. what about other things on the bikes? The group set, like the components, you know. I'm drive so, train, brakes. I'm not, I'm not so convinced about gearing, but brakes, I think brakes. you definitely, if you get a good set of brakes mm -hmm. compared to a set of brakes which is cheaper, not got enough power. Yeah. So yeah, I think there's lots of pros and cons in terms of does more money equals more speed, but I think the things we talked about there are pretty relevant, right? Yeah, for sure. So does more money equal more speed? Well, yes, sometimes. But what about the money you guys have been spending over the last month? This question in from Island Ariel, who asks, um, I upgraded the Centaur fork to a Fox fork on my Cube Reaction Hybrid Pro. Now the front wheel is too wide for the forks. Are there spaces I can remove to make the wheel fit? So it what, sounds... was, what was the wheel? So it sounded, <laughs> like you had a boost front hub, now you've gone to a non-boost uh, set of forks. So effectively a boost hub is 110 millimeters wide, whereas a non-boost hub is 100 mil wide. So you need to lose 10 mil of spaces. You might have an adapter kit available for that front hub, or other options is you could get your original hub laced into a new rim, but it tends to be quite costly. So I think the most cost-effective option would be to either look for a second-hand wheel that's compatible with those forks, or get down to your bike shop and get that rebuilt 
but there could be some adapters available maybe yeah. for that wheel as well. You can simply pull out those adapters on the end with just a set of pliers and usually yeah. to pull straight out. You can put a, a, a narrower spacer in there, so a few different options. Send us what wheel you've got and mm -hmm. we can answer the question more fully. Yeah. Get Dodi uh, on that one. Kieran Cave. Yeah, he says, uh, ask EMBN, I am in the market for a 150 mil full suspension E mountain bike. What are some good options? Ooh. Loads, isn't there? Where do you begin with that one? I think 150 mil is a sweet spot at the minute, I think, for an all-round E mountain bike, do you think? Yeah, well, that's a big question as well. True, but off the uh, top of my head, you've got the Spectral on, 150 mil, that's 27.5 rear, 29 yeah. a front, obviously specialized Levo, seems to be quite a benchmark bike as well, that's 29 uh, Front yeah. and rear, 150 mil. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you. I mean, most of the brands. Mm. I mean, most of the brands have got 150 mil bikes. Yeah. Uh, maybe the question is, what sort of maybe you know, what motor do you want? Mm -hmm. What's what's your budget? Um, what type of display do you want? Uh, what size battery? I, I'd I'd say the bigger question mm -hmm. is, what's your budget? Can you actually go for like a 625? Uh, Bosch or a Shimano battery, can you actually go to the 705 watt hour sh specialized battery? Mm. I mean, that's going to give you more range. I yeah. mean, oh, it's not quite as straightforward as, you know, 150 mil travel, is it, Chris? No, exactly. So, but as I said, that is a good spot for bikes, uh, good travel. Have a look, actually, at the Levo video. We did a yeah, video on the Specialized Levo, which is 150 mil travel. Uh, pretty much does everything. So what is it? Well, it's 150 mil travel. It comes with 29 inch wheels, but you can swap those out to 27.5. It comes with a flip chip, which means you can swap out the geometry. And also remember that the weight, the alloy version of this bike, is in fact lighter than the current S-Works carbon. Elsewhere, there's no flimsy speed sensor control. All the cables are taken out of the down tube. It's more efficient, it's more powerful, and it's more connected. Well, there you go. Um, 150 mil travel, Chris, a yeah. big question. Debbie Rowlands is asking, I heard there's a maximum permissible weight on e-bikes and riders. Is this true? Yeah. Absolutely. That's correct, especially on those lighter weight e-bikes. I think um, Bulls did a super light e-bike, which was around 19 kilos, and I think they had a 120 kilo weight limit with rider and kit. Uh, combined on there, so mm -hmm. it is something you definitely well, need to look at. You get that one then. No, or you. <laughs> <laughs> but just think about if you're carrying extra batteries and obviously like a uh, camelback full of water, things like that, you need to add all that to the uh, to your weight. So, yeah, yeah. definitely something. I think, to think, about. I think if you check the manufacturer's website, there are actually system weight limits mm -hmm. which they publicize on their site. So, it's probably yeah. the first uh, port of call, I think, don't we? Definitely. Okay, JL93, he's saying, where are the E downhill bikes at? Will we be seeing any soon, or is it any option to put a downhill fork on a bike like Josh Bryceland has done on his Cannondale? No, not at all. I mean, obviously, Specialized have just come out with the new Kinevo, mm -hmm. which you've done a video on. Yeah. Uh, actually, we've done a whole feature on long travel E mountain bikes. Uh, so, JL93, have a look at, uh, at this video, which we've made recently. Now, an e-downhill bike or an e-long travel bike is a certain breed with certain characteristics about it which set it apart from many other e-bikes such as all mountain ones or enduro ones. It could even be the bike that you substitute for an uplift truck up in the mountains. So its use is primarily going to be getting involved in uh, more gravity style riding. You've got lots of rocks, got lots of roots to get involved with. So the geometry needs to be specific to that type of riding. Now, a similar but different question uh, has come in from Carl Faulkner and Carl's asking should he go for a bigger or a smaller e-mountain bike is bigger better is basically the question he's asking Travel should he wise, go yeah. for should he go for e-mountain bike enduro or should he go for e-mountain bike downhill mm -hmm. It's a similar question, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think if you were to swing your leg over one of the new school big travel e-bikes, I think you'd be pretty blown away. For instance, I ride the Specialized Kinevo quite a lot. But you're think, Chris Smith. I know, but I think that bike has been adapted so you've got the best of both worlds. That's the great thing about e-mountain bikes. There isn't no compromise. I think if you go back to a, like a, a standard mountain bike, then you have to get that compromise of a bike that will descend or will climb better. You know, I think that the Kinevo is the best of both worlds. It's a bike that's really capable of going down the hill, but it can absolutely fly uphill as well. So yeah. I think for me, I think... Does it depend on the type of trails you're riding, Kyle? What trails are you going to ride most of mm. all? Because a long travel bike like the Kinevo Chris is talking mm. about, it's, it's a full-on bike that 
That is gross. It's a little bit heavier as well, and it <laughs> has become a little bit more hard to maneuver around on those tighter turns. You know, you've got the dual crown forks and the bigger, longer wheelbase, things like that. So it is a little bit, but it depends what your bias of riding is. You know, if mm. I think I was shredding downhill runs, like a lot of my trails tend to be more downhill than climbs, then yeah. that's think, what my fun is, riding downhill, so I'd go for the bigger travel. I think to answer the question, bigger is better as long as you've got the terrain to match. apply that bike to. Yeah. Otherwise, if you've not got the terrain, then bigger is not better. No. It's just, I mean, and the other, the other thing is, it's just different, it's not better. No, exactly. So like 150 bike and a 180 bike, they're just different, they're not better than each other. I think you need to get along to a demo day and we've done a video exactly all about that. So why then would you do a demo event in the first place? Well, the primary aim is actually to make sure you make the right decision of e-bike for you. It's also a good way to open your eyes to exactly what's on the market. After all, the market is overflowing with different brands. For example, Lapierre, Orange, Specialized, Cube, Canyon. There's so many bikes out there. It's not only just the bikes, it's also the model within the range as well. For example, this high bike, an Enduro 180 mil travel or the All Mountain 150 mil travel. And it's not just the models, it's the component respects within those, that range as well. Plus, of course, there's that important thing about fit and sizing. Single Track MTB is asking, should Strava come out of e-bike segments, analysis and leaderboards that are purely just for e-bikes? Yeah, I think so, 100%. You're a Strava warrior, Steve, aren't you? No, I think um, they already do that actually on the app. If you do just upload a standard ride, you'll soon get a load of hassle from people flagging it, saying it's too fast and that, so just be sure to change it to e-bikes. But to me, I can see the issue on the climbs, but for the downhill sections, I don't think it's such a big problem to be up against normal bikes on e-bikes, but there you go. Yeah, uh, Onze Man in Kazakhstan. Or oh, does that say One's Man in Kazakhstan? One's a Man. One's a Man. Uh, you've been asking quite a few questions, right? One's Man in Kazakhstan. Regular. Yeah. Hi guys, thanks for featuring my question. I moved from a 2017 Cube Hardtail with a Fox Rhythm with a 100mm travel to my current 2019 Cube Stereo with a 140mm Sento Ion. And I find the gain travel seemed like I'm running a sponge. So the question is, I guess, there's so much movement in the bike when I pedal. This is my first full suspension bikes after using a hardtail, blah, blah, blah. Does too much travel mean more sag? So I think you're saying that you're struggling adapting coming from a hardtail to a full suspension bike, like the pedaling and the feel of the bike. Now, obviously suspension setup is definitely key to getting a good performance out of your bike, but I think it's a case of adaption. I think it is a big thing. I know when I swap from a, a hardtail to a full suspension bike or backwards, you know, the other way, it is quite hard, especially when it comes to pedaling hard, you know, like when you're pedaling on a full suspension bike, it feels sometimes your pedaling sort of <coughs> being wasted compared to a hardtail bike. Mm -hmm. I think the feeling of the two different bikes is pretty massive. To I fair. mean, there is there is movement when you pedal. I, mm -hmm. I guess, is your suspension set up correctly? Maybe a quick visit to a specialist, special mm -hmm. shop or a specialist uh, suspension uh, store to to make sure your bike is, is done correctly. Yeah, I think one of the main things about suspension setup is sag as well. And we've done a video all about that one. So just make sure you're dialed in as per the video. We quite regularly get people say that I am 83 kilos naked. Right. Um, <laughs> don't tem tend to ride naked, but uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's one of those things. Make sure you're kitted like you'd be riding. So if you ride with tools, a belt, a pack, whatever yeah. it is, have all that on as well. Yeah. Because um, that's all suspended mass. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see, um, we have to get a steel rule, actually measure it, but I mean, yeah. it looks visually bit, around 30% on Yeah, there, it might it? be a little bit more than that, but yeah, yeah we're, we're there or thereabouts, so. Randy MTB asks, hello EMBN crew, this is a question directed at Steve or Chris. Personal choice when it comes to deciding on whether to ride your regular mountain bike or your e-mountain bike, what circumstances do you ride a standard mountain bike over your e-mountain bike? Well, Randy, uh, I think it's good to familiarize or remind yourself what it is like to ride a non-e-bike because I think it's important to, to get the torque through your legs mm -hmm. and you can, you need when you ride on an e-man bike. You need to make sure that you're having a workout and not getting into lazy mode yeah. or plodding. So yeah. uh, I actually ride a road bike uh, every week to, to just to kind of just to mix it up, really. Yeah, yeah. I think the only time I touch a standard mountain bike now is for just messing around, like the trick style of riding. If I was going to go ride street or skate park things like that, just get dialed in on my tricks. I will ride a standard mountain bike. Really, but for the, really, pretty much anything really? off road. Really, I will be on an e-man bike now because <laughs> I just hate pushing bikes up a hill. 
NR is asking, hi Stephen, Chris, can you please tell me what people refer to when they say suspension kinematics? I'm not too sure about this. Great videos, by the way, keep up the good work. Cheers. Well, nice one, NR. I guess in a, in a sort of basic term, it's basically the design of the suspension. You can either have sort of progressive suspension, you can have linear suspension, but it's it has an effect on the on the on the dynamic ride of the bike, I guess, if you like. So, like a progressive suspension system, it, you go into the suspension. It's got some force in there, past the the midway mark of the travel, so it enables you to get more feedback on the trail, so you can move the bike around quite easily. Whereas a, a linear style suspension design, I mean, these are two very simple examples here. Is well, it is. It's linear, so it's quite, it's a little bit more difficult to to move the bike around. It you know it does hug the ground quite well but um yeah kinematics it's it's a minefield you can have so many different types of suspension kinematics i don't know actually where to begin with that there's uh there's many websites out there actually which which goes goes through the whole rigmarole of of suspension design so um yeah just i think that's something you need to just explore on the world wide web nice Bob Ferguson has a bad knee, uh, osteoarthritis. I'm looking at getting an EMTV. My road bike I use absolute black oval subcompact chain rings. Do you know if they would be okay to use on an e-mounted bike? Um, I'm not, I don't know, are we skilled enough to answer this question? Yeah. In terms of, I mean, there's a lot of physiology involved in this. Physiology. Now, um, basically, you're asking if an oval chainring works with an E mountain bike. Well, but, but I'm thinking, does Bob actually need to have an oval chainring? No, that's what I'm saying. I think, and well, an oval chainring doesn't work at all with an e bike anyway, because all e bikes have a front free wheel system, whereas on a standard mountain bike crank, an oval chainring stays in the same pitch as, as the uh, crank arm as well. So it does make a difference. But if you've got an oval chainring that's spinning, in no relation to the crank arms can have no effect on the crank whatsoever. One thing you might find that will help out with your knees is to fit a shorter crank length so you, when you're on those bigger strokes, it isn't gonna be such a uh, stretch on your knee. Do you think, I think the motor as well is gonna negate a load of stress out of pedal. Yeah, I think there's gonna be less torque going through your knees, mm. so, but I'm, 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 I'm a bit concerned, Bob, whether the, the repetitiveness of an e-bike because you do tend to spin a lot, what mm. effect that'll have on you. Yeah. I, you know, I've heard loads of people who, who do have bad knees and osteoarthritis have you, are using e-bikes to their benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd actually go and ride an e-bike first yeah. before maybe making a call on it, because mm. I, I, like I said, I don't think I'm qualified to recommend yeah. chain rings or e-bikes mm. to you. But yeah, uh, I think it's gonna be a lot less stress for the knee, but as you say, possibly more cadence going through it. So we don't know what affects your knee more, mm. you know, is it the spinning or is it the actual torque that you've got through your knee? But I would imagine you go, and, if, if you go and ride an e-bike, mm -hmm. you will be, it'll be an expensive bike ride. I guarantee you, I think with <laughs> your condition, you probably will be buying an e-mountain bike. Sure. So that's it for this month's Ask EMBN. Don't forget, if you want to get your questions answered, drop some in the comments box down below and we'll get back to you next month. Yeah, bigger or better, harder or faster, or remember this week's question, which was, does more money give you more speed? Get involved in this question. It's a big question. There's a big impact on our lives and you know what, what we can do with our spare money as a result of that. Yeah, give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and don't forget to smash the globe in the middle to subscribe to EMBN. Hard and fast.